on to last but certainly not least, <laughs> David Lockbaum, who is director of the Nuclear Safety Project for the Union of Concerned Scientists. Go ahead, David. Thank you and good morning. UCS appreciates this opportunity to present our views on this important topic. Slide two, please. Fukushima was not entirely a surprise. Instead, it was yet another disaster caused by assuming that the severity or frequency of hazards would be less than they actually were. When one aims high and misses, people may still be protected. When one aims low and misses, people pay a steep price. The only surprise is why we continue to aim low. Next slide, please. A hallmark of nuclear safety is defense and depth barriers. But aiming low on every one of those barriers sets the stage for a single challenge overwhelming all the barriers, regardless of their number. Had Fukushima not aimed low on just one, just one of these five barriers, we'd likely not be here today. Slide four, please. So the primary lesson from Fukushima is don't aim low. Or if one has to aim low, then one has to make sure certain that lower standards still provide adequate protection. In other words, second guessing after the next disaster should not be easily blamed on bad decision making today. Next slide, please. On hydrogen control, buildings blowing up must not be the first clue to workers that our hydrogen is collecting in places. Yet many buildings in our plants today lack hydrogen monitoring instrumentation that clearly needs to be fixed. Next slide, please. This is a schematic of a boiling water reactor. Routine airborne releases are filtered by the off-gas system shown on the lower right of the schematic. Airborne releases during design basis accidents are filtered by the standby gas treatment system in the upper center. Airborne releases during severe accidents are not filtered as shown in the lower left. So when the hazard is very likely the greatest, we provide the least protection of the public. That's simply unacceptable. Next slide, please. There's simply no justification, no reasonable justification, to require airborne releases to be filtered during routine operation and design basis accidents, but to tolerate unfiltered releases during severe accidents. It was wrong before Fukushima, it's wronger now. Next slide, please. This is the NRC's list of priorities five days into the Fukushima disaster. The condition on units one, two, and three were far worse than reached at any time during the Three Mile Island accident, yet the highest priority of the NRC was the unit four spent fuel pool. The 408 irradiated fuel bundles and dry storage at Fukushima that day were not even on the NRC's list of priorities, let alone on top of it. We're doing a pitiful job of managing spent fuel hazards, and we have to fix this before we pay a high price for aiming so low. Next slide, please. Three, and slide 10, please. The spent fuel pool hazard was so dire and so real that desperate measures were taken at Fukushima. Water was dropped from helicopters and sprayed from water cannons on fire trucks below. One did not need water pistols or fans for the much lower hazard of dry cast storage at Fukushima. There's a lesson here if we're only open our eyes and our minds. Next slide, please. Slide 12, please. The NRC may share some of the guilt in the federal government's failure to provide a repository for spent fuel more than 50 years after the first civilian nuclear power plant began producing it. But allowing that guilt or whatever other excuse is offered to continue to expose millions of Americans to unnecessarily elevated risks is unacceptable and must be fixed. Next slide, please. This is a picture of some of the dry casks at Fukushima after the tsunami. They did not get much TV coverage or Twitter time because they posed almost zero threat to anyone at any time. Shame on us if we continue to store irradiated fuel in overcrowded spent fuel pools rather than in safer and more secure dry storage. Next slide, please. I'm making a formal allegation under the NRC's allegation program that the Pilgrim Nuclear Plant in Massachusetts and the Cooper Nuclear Plant in Nebraska do not comply with federal safety regulations and general design criteria in 44 and in 10 CFR 50.49 because the safety-related cooling system for their reactor buildings cannot handle the decay heat loads in their spent fuel pools following a design basis accident. This is not a beyond design basis problem. 
It is a problem right here, right now. These are safety violations that must be fixed. Next slide, please. The NRC is currently setting the stage for a nuclear Eastland. The Eastland capsized while tied to the dock in Chicago, killing more passengers than died on the Titanic. The Eastland capsized largely due to the weight of lifeboats and davits added per federal law after the Titanic disaster. The NRC proposes to rely on high volume water sprays or makeup to spent fuel pools as a last resort. Let's not replace a nuclear disaster caused by a natural tsunami with one caused by a human made tsunami. Next slide, please. Records obtained under the Freedom of Information Act reveal that the NRC went to great lengths to ensure that its staff going to Japan had potassium iodide, even though their workstations were more than 10 miles away from the stricken site. Americans deserve that same protection and consideration. Next slide, please. Last year, Millstone and Pilgrim each experienced operator mistakes during routine plant operations. Those mistakes caused the operators to literally lose control of the reactor core's power levels. It's aiming very low to assume that operator performance will magically be better under the stress of, of severe accidents while they implement seldom seen procedures. Next slide, please. We must aim higher by requiring formal, formal NRC evaluation of severe accident procedures and the operator's proficiencies in using them. I've heard many people say that the few operators currently required in control rooms already have too much on their plates and would be distracted by their focus on making money for plant operators. If so, the, oper the owners can use some of those profits to hire more operators so that there'll be some folks in the control rooms trained to protect the public during severe accidents. Next slide, please. We learned from the Freedom of Information Act documents that many state officials queried the Nuclear Regulatory Commission following the 50 mile evacuation recommendation if that demonstrated that the NRC would publicly second guess protective action measures called for by their governors. Next slide, please. That question seems valid. We hope that its answer is not that the NRC will remain silent when it disagrees with measures being taken to protect the public. We recommend that the biannual emergency exercises periodically include the NRC pretending or simulating disagreement with the state's protective action measures to test how such differences would be reconciled. Thank you. Great, thank you, David. You've got us ahead of time here.